Hi, good afternoon. 1230 on a Thursday afternoon, kind of rainy, cloudy. Uh, we're happy to have you back here again. Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn. Uh, we have a treat here today. Uh, lots of great pictures and a great dermatology talk. Uh, Dr. Baden and Dr. Doe are here today. Excuse me. Um, next slide, Di, please. Oh, sorry. That's okay. So just a quick, uh, couple of quick promos. First, uh, upcoming Lunch and Learn. We have another uh, dermatology talk, back-to-back -back skin. Um, for, for the end of September. And then following that, we have Sam Bott's second part, rhinology, and then uh, Dr. Megan Mystery, October 14th, opioid prescribing and primary care. Really excited about that talk. And then October 21st, we're going to hear um, in, uh, about the thyroid biopsy clinic and to biopsy or not to biopsy. We always have a contest about the greatest, uh, greatest titles. And I skipped your title, Di and Lynn, which is out damn spot. So that's up there. So I appreciate the creativity. These talks are all up there on YouTube, Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn. All you have to do is search there. We also post them up on our intranet, Newton, and you're welcome to search them there. Next slide. Sorry. And uh, just uh, two quick promos, uh, two of our centers we'd like to push. One of ours is our Newton Wellesley Hospital Spine Center located on beautiful Wells Ave, uh, 243-5777. All your spine needs all together. We have a navigator ready to answer your patient's questions, get the patients in quickly, get them triaged either to um, EMNR, to physical therapy, to a spine surgeon, um, x-rays, MRIs, et cetera, all one number. You can make the referral through Epic or just by calling that number, giving the patients that number. Next slide. And also uh, we have our new Newton Wellesley Hospital Thyroid Biopsy Clinic. It's a nice multidisciplinary biopsy clinic bringing together endocrine, thyroid surgeons, cytology, and radiologists all in one location. You get those reports back of nodules that you don't know how to manage, nodules um, with suspicious features, unsure whether you need to rescan them or biopsy them. Please send them to our new thyroid clinic. They're waiting to see your patients, easily referred by just putting thyroid biopsy clinic in your epic bar and it'll come up. Um, of course, if you have it, here's the number, 831-7256. Um, and of course, you can email them as well. If you're having trouble getting in touch with them in those three ways, please uh, reach out to us. We'd be happy to get you going. Next. And uh, take it away. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lynn Baden. I'm a dermatologist in Wellesley Hills. I see patients um, with a group uh, three days a week here out in Wellesley and one day a week I'm at Mass General seeing general dermatology patients. And uh, next slide, please. And this is me, and this is the location of our practice in Wellesley Hills. Next slide. So what I'm gonna talk about today is non-melanoma skin cancer. And you may see the letters NMSC in EPIC, and that stands for non-melanoma skin cancer, which is a very long um, set of words to say. The basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma are true carcinomas. But I'm also going to talk a lot about actinic keratoses, which are considered to be pre-skin cancers. So they have a risk of turning into squamous cell carcinoma. So I will talk about that. There are a lot of basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers in this country. There are about 5.4 million of them. And that occurs in about 3.3 million Americans, which means that the a um, person who has a basal cell is likely to have another basal cell or a squamous cell. It's estimated that about 20% of the non-melanoma skin cancers are squamous cell skin cancers, although that number is increasing. And why that's important is because there are about 2,000 deaths a year from non-melanoma skin cancer, but they are primarily the squamous cell skin cancer. And just as sort of a comparison, there's 100,000 new melanoma cases a year with 8,000 deaths. Now, when we use the term non-melanoma skin cancer, we generally are referring to basal cell and squamous cell. Although to be precise, there are other non-melanoma skin cancers, which include Merkel cell, B and T cell, B and T cell lymphomas, and Kaposi's and other angiosarcomas. But when you see the letters NMSC, basically we're talking about basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers. Next slide. 
So the risk factors for non-melanoma skin cancer are basically sunlight, sunlight, and sunlight. And their risk factors are directly related to sun exposure. Fair skin, light colored eyes, red hair, poor tanning ability, and older age, because probably that person has accumulated more sun exposure. High number of past sunburns is also a risk factor and probably exposure at younger ages rather than older ages uh, are, is a risk factor. And as an example of that, someone who grew up in Australia till the age of 10 has a higher risk of non-melanoma skin cancer than someone who moved from Maine to Australia when they were 40 years old. So again, it's probably exposure at younger ages, which is more important. And other risk factors for non-melanoma skin cancer include prior non-melanoma skin cancers, males, tanning booth use, which is really not recommended, uh, phototherapy, which is light treatment for things like psoriasis, uh, prior radiation treatments, burn scars, and immunosuppression are all risk factors for non-melanoma skin cancer. Next slide. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is um, or actinic keratoses, which are keratinocyte neoplasms, which generally occur on skin that has had a lot of sun exposure in the past. The classic description is that of the lesion on the left, which is a rough scaly patch on a red base. Now that's not the only presentation of actinic keratoses. The center photo is that of what we call a cutaneous horn, which actually are quite common on the ears as is seen in this picture. The photo in the right is called a hypertrophic actinic keratosis. Now, oftentimes you can't actually see an actinic keratosis, but it's more like you feel, feel around. The patient will say, I have a rough patch on my forehead. And so you can feel that actinic keratosis. Well, how do we treat actinic keratoses? Generally, when it's like the lesion on the left, we just freeze it with liquid nitrogen. Patient is in the office, we uh, recognize the actinic keratosis and treat it with liquid nitrogen. The lesion in the middle and on the right are more difficult to treat with cryotherapy. They're just too thick. So what do we do? Generally, we would do a shave removal. Now, the good thing about a shave removal is not only do you remove the lesion, but you actually also get pathology. So if in fact these lesions have turned into skin cancer, then we have the pathology uh, in addition to doing that small removal. Now, other times that we biopsy these lesions occur when a patient presents with what we think is an actinic keratosis. We freeze it with liquid nitrogen. We say, come back in three months, we'll see if it's still there. And they come back and they say, well, it went away for a while, but now it's back. And so then we might freeze it a second time, maybe longer and harder, and then say, come back in three months. And if it's still there at that point, we might do what's called a curette type of removal. And that's why we numb up the area and use a very sharp little instrument to scrape it away. Again, we get pathology, but we also remove the lesion. Next slide. Well, what do we do when we see this? And this is a really common presentation uh, here in Massachusetts. Next slide. We do what's called field treatment. So we're treating an entire field of keratoses. We manage multiple keratoses in a contiguous area. What's good about field treatment is that you can treat what you see, what you can't see, what you feel, what you can't feel, and it reduces the risk of developing new actinic keratoses. There are many procedures to choose from, and depending on the presentation and patient preference, which I'll go into, uh, we would choose a different approach. Next slide. These are typical examples of what we treat for field treatment. We would treat 
the nose and the cheeks in this woman and the temple in this gentleman. Next slide. The common treatments, uh, field treatments for actinic keratosis include the use of 5-fluorouracil cream, 5-FU, uh, topical imiquimod, which is the same imiquimod we use to treat genital warts, and something called photodynamic therapy. And again, the choice is commonly due to patient preference. Next slide. Topical 5-FU or imiquimod create significant inflammatory responses during the treatment time, and then take a few weeks to improve after you stop the treatment. So you really must educate the patient as to what to expect. And we even show pictures of what to expect, because this can be quite a shock if you have no idea that it's coming. In addition, we have the patients call in during the time that they're being treated. Sometimes they send photos in so that we can reassure them that this is what's supposed to be happening. The 5-fluorouracil is used for three weeks and the imiquimod for 12 weeks. The choice of the patient is based on what I think is how much inflammation you're gonna get. I find that with 5-FU, there's a lot more inflammation but it's over in three weeks. Whereas the imiquimod, the inflammation may be less, but it is over 12 weeks. So you're either the three week person or the 12 week person. Next slide. The last type of field treatment I'm gonna describe is what we call photodynamic therapy or PDT, which is actually also very common. What people like about PDT is that they come in, they get treated, and that's the end of the field treatment. We apply a product called 5-aminolevulonic acid or ALA, which is a photosensitizer. This ALA is selectively taken up by the more rapidly dividing cells. So the actinic keratoses, ones that you can see and ones that you can't yet see because they haven't quite come out yet. Then we use light to activate this ALA and that results in oxygen species that destroy the actinic keratoses. A common protocol is that someone comes in, we apply the acid and they sit there for an hour waiting. And then we apply this, uh, we expose them to a blue light for 16 minutes and some odd seconds. And it can be very painful for some people. So protocols have sort of changed over time and, and um, to try to decrease the pain. And the patient will have scaling and crusting for several days to a week. And photo protection is necessary for 48 hours because the photosensitizer will last that long. Next slide. The next thing I'm gonna talk about are basal cell carcinomas. And these are what I call my medical student basal cells. Typically a pearly papule with telangiectasia throughout. So these are typical basal cell carcinoma. Next page, next slide. These are other examples of common basal cell carcinoma. The one on the left and the right lower are what we call pigmented. Uh, basal cell carcinomas. So sometimes they're difficult to differentiate a basal cell from a melanoma. The center basal cell is called a morpheiform basal cell or scar-like. Sometimes it's very difficult to define where the lesion begins and where it ends, and these can go quite deep. And then we have a basal cell in the right upper corner, which is a depressed plaque. Next slide. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common human cancer worldwide and is seen in approximately 2 million Americans um, each year. The incidence continues to increase yearly. And one of the issues with the basal cell carcinoma is that it is very costly for this healthcare system. There are many different treatments for basal cell carcinoma, but it's just basically the huge number of these lesions that causes such a cost. Next slide. Basal cell carcinomas are divided into whether they're low versus high risk. And that's based on location, size, 
uh, whether you can see where the borders are, primary versus recurrent disease, the histology and host factors. Next slide. The low risk basal cell carcinoma is what we commonly treat in all the dermatology practices. We generally excise them. And the uh, pros of doing that is that you get pathology of the margins until you know whether or not the lesion has been removed. The other treatment that we use is called electrodesiccation and curatage. And what that is, is where we scrape at the lesion and then burn the base or electrodesiccate the base. And we repeat that three times and that's considered to be a treatment. That is supposedly the same recurrence rate as a true excision. However, in my experience, I find that there is a higher recurrence rate with the electrodesiccation and curatage. People choose their uh, method of treatment based on several factors, but one is healing time. The excision, you come in, you have the treatment, you come back again in two weeks and the sutures are removed. Some people don't wanna bother with coming in back in in two weeks. And so they can do a de electrodesiccation and curatage because it's a one shot deal. You come in, you get treated. However, the healing takes about a month. So you have to take care of it for a month. And some people would prefer just to come in and get an excision and come back two weeks later to get the stitches out. And that would be the end of it. In addition, the electrodesiccation and curatage can leave some very unsightly white scars. So generally we uh, use that on the back or sometimes on the legs. And high-risk basal cells, what Dr. Doe will be talking about, which is Mohs micrographic surgery. Next slide. The final thing that I'm gonna talk about are squamous cell carcinomas. Now, Traditionally, it's been thought that among the non-melanoma skin cancer, 20% of them are squamous cell. Although again, that's incidence is approaching that of basal cell. It's thought that an actinic keratosis has a 0.1 to 20% chance of converting to a squamous cell carcinoma. So clearly that's a very wide range. So it's not clear what the true incidence of actinic keratosis converting to squamous cell carcinoma is. Just to put it into context, the mortality rate of squamous cell carcinoma is approximate that of renal and oropharyngeal carcinoma and melanoma in the sunbelt of this country. So it definitely has a mortality rate associated with it. And again, risk factors include exposure to sunlight, light skin, age, male sex, immunosuppression, and human papillomavirus. I just wanna say that although squamous cell and basal cell carcinomas are more common in light skin individuals, they are definitely seen in darker skin tones. And we often see patients from Central or South America who have the basal cell or the squamous cell carcinoma. So you still have to think about it in the non-white individuals. Next. So squamous cell carcinomas definitely have a higher recurrence rate and certainly a greater metastatic potential than basal cell carcinomas. And histopathology is key. When we're biopsying something that we think is a basal cell skin cancer, we could do a shave, we could do a curette because we're not really worried about how deep the lesion goes. With squamous cell carcinoma, we are very much dependent on the pathology. So we do a punch biopsy, which gets us deeper. You can see perineural involvement, which then suggests a higher metastatic and recurrence rate. So with the squamous cell carcinoma, we do prefer a punch biopsy. Greater size and location on the lip have higher metastatic rates immunosuppression, solid organ transplant patients are definitely at higher risk of squamous cell carcinoma and they're very common. I just wanted to point out that there is a TNM description of squamous cell carcinoma. So you definitely see metastatic disease and local nodal involvement. Next. 
So these are some pictures of things that I have biopsied and what the final answer is. On the left, I was convinced that this lesion was gonna be a squamous cell carcinoma. I knew it was gonna be one. And it turned out to be a hypertrophic actinic keratosis. So you can't always tell just by looking. The lesion on the right, I thought was gonna be a hypertrophic actinic keratosis. And it turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Next slide. The lesion on the left here, I thought was gonna be a basal cell skin cancer, and it proved to be a squamous cell carcinoma arising in an actinic keratosis. So you're actually seeing the transformation of a pre-malignant lesion into a malignant one. Next slide. The treatment of squamous cell carcinoma of the non-metastatic metastatic type is excision and is simply done like we do basal cells. The patient comes in, we cut it out, we send it for pathology, and then we have our margins. And Mohs micrographic surgery is indicated for certain situations, which we will see in the next talk. And radiation is done for non-surgical candidates and radiation is also used to treat certain individuals with basal cell skin cancer. We also have topical treatments for squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Those include imiquimod and topical 5-FU, which are the same things that we use for actinic keratosis, although the protocols are different for squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And we can also talk about curatage and electrodesiccation for these early lesions. Next. This I just wanted to point out because I thought she was an interesting example. Uh, the biopsy on the left lower lip lesion, uh, the right lower lip lesion on the left side of the screen was a squamous cell carcinoma um, in a renal transplant patient. And she actually went to a head and neck surgeon who removed the squamous cell and the scar resulted that you see on the right. However, soon after she developed another lesion on her chin, which was biopsied and proved to be a squamous cell carcinoma. The head and neck surgeon was concerned that this might be actually a local recurrence and so had her treated with radiation therapy. Um, and so that was just a typical example of a renal transplant patient. Next. So these are some of my last thoughts about non-melanoma skin cancer. Um, if you have one, within five years, you have a 40% chance of having another one. If you've had more than one, then you have an 82% five-year probability of a second one or a third one. In addition, the risk of melanoma after having one non-melanoma skin cancer is two to three times a relative risk. Because of these recurrences and because of the risk of melanoma, once to twice yearly dermatologic exam is indicated for these patients with non-melanoma skin cancer. And at those visits, we emphasize sun protection, sun avoidance, and definitely tanning bed avoidance. We recommend sunscreens and other sun protective behaviors such as shading, wearing broad brim, brim hats, and SPF clothing, which is very common now. Now, the last two points that I just want to bring up um, is something that you might see in your patients and you might under, uh, wonder why they're on certain medications. Well, in organ transplant patients with a history of non-melanoma skin cancer, you can reduce the incidence of further squamous cell skin cancer with the use of acetretin, which is a vitamin A analog. It does have many side effects associated with it, but it's also uh, commonly used. And then in our non-immunosuppressed population, we are putting patients on oral nicotinamide because it's thought that it may reduce the risk for subsequent non-melanoma skin cancer in these patients. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Doe to talk about Mohs micrographic surgery. Thank you, Lynn. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you all for your attention today and the opportunity to speak to you about Mohs uh, surgery. Uh, I um, am a Mohs surgeon at the Newton Wellesley Dermatology Associates and 
We are located about four minutes away from Newton Wellesley Hospital, right across uh, Route 95. I wanna give a shout out to some of my uh, colleagues in the practice, uh, some of whom you may know. And uh, in terms of referrals, we're happy to take uh, referrals via Epic, email, fax, or phone. Epic is probably uh, the easiest uh, thing for us. Uh, I have no disclosures to report today, and so I'll dig into it. So what is Mohs surgery? First of all, it's not an abbreviation. It's named after Dr. Frederick Mohs, who developed the technique in the 1940s and 50s. It's a... Uh, technique in which we can examine interoperably the entire surgical margin using frozen sections. And by examining the margins, I can see where the skin cancer still remains in the patient, target further excision in that area, and uh, in a, a sequential fashion, remove the skin cancer. That allows me to offer the highest cure rate um, while sparing healthy tissue. Um, so uh, I thought I'd walk you through a typical uh, Mohs uh, case. So here the tumor is identified and uh, curetted. Uh, then uh, I'll cut around the tumor with very narrow margins using uh, a beveled margin. Uh, I put some nicks in there so I can keep track of which edge is which. And the whole goal is to remove the uh, skin cancer in this uh, saucer shaped piece of tissue. The deep margin is freed up with some scissors and then it's brought to the lab. In the lab, what we'll do is we'll carefully uh, divide the tissue and then ink the margins. And the inking is important to keep track of the edges. A map is created so we know um, where things are. This is an example of the, the frozen sections uh, that basically the tissue is pushed down so that all of the epidermis is pushed down towards the outside and all the deep margins pushed down onto a flat surface so that we're essentially compressing the surgical margin, the true surgical margin into a flat plane, which is then cut with a micro tone. So that shave off of the, the tissue represents the entire surgical margin. Um, the uh, slides are stained and then uh, I'll look at the slides myself. Uh, Mo's training includes uh, you know, um, a lot of experience in reading the, uh, the pathology slides at the margin. Here's an example of uh, a second layer or, or the, the first layer in which there's a little bit of uh, positivity here. It's hard to see in the low power view, but in the high power view, uh, it shows those blue islands of cells that's infiltrated BCC and then it's mapped back um, to where it is in the patient. And uh, here, second uh, layer is taken out where that only where the positive part is or only where the tumor remains do, uh, do we take an additional piece of tissue. And then that is processed um, with frozen sections again and keep on doing that till all the margins are clear. Um, so most surgery is uh, better than surgical uh, excision in the sense that the entire surgical margin is evaluated. In your typical elliptical excision, uh, the specimen, when it's sent to pathology, is bread loafed down the long axis of the ellipse, and only selected uh, slices are examined. For example, in uh, piece number two, uh, that would be called negative or the margins are free, but you can see in section B, in between the, the slices one and two, you can still have uh, missed cancer that's at the actual margin. And if you look at the, uh, the pathology report, uh, they'll often say you know, negative in the, in the um, sections examined. So what are the advantages of most surgery? Basically your high cure rate and it's uh, 97 to 99% for primary tumors, 94% for recurrent tumors. Uh, and it compares very favorably uh, versus standard excision, destruction, and radiation. Um, again, uh, most surgery has the advantage of tissue uh, conservation, uh, and that generates the smallest surgical defect possible. So since most surgery is often done in very high value real estate, for example, the nose, the eyelids, the ear, uh, creating the smallest surgical uh, defect is extremely important in making the uh, subsequent repair um, easier. 
And then finally, you know, we have interoperative confirmation of clear margins, which gives most surgeons the confidence to repair with the, with the best uh, surgical technique possible. Most surgery is pretty cost effective. Uh, and um, you can look at those figures. It compares very favorably with uh, office excision with permanent sections or even frozen sections. Um, and so I thought I'd give you some uh, samples here. This is the squamous cell carcinoma, the earlobe, which cleared in two sections and then was repaired with excellent results one year later. Um, here's the basal cell of the cutaneous upper lip. Um, repaired with a rotation flap, uh, and you can see that the filtrum is unaffected, the nasolabial fold is intact. And uh, sometimes patients get more than one skin cancer. Here's a double Mose um, with excellent results on the hand. Um, and so I just want to thank you all again. Shout out to my, uh, to my practice and happy to take your referrals. I know uh, we're running out of time and I'll also list Dr. Baden's uh, practice information. Thank you both, uh, Dr. Baden, Dr. Doe's great talk. Um, great pictures, especially that last one with the ear. I hope people appreciated that one. Um, uh, we are up against the hour. Um, there was a question about the nicotinamide dose um, that Dr. Baden put the answer in, it's 500 twice a day. Any other questions? I'm sure these guys would be happy to field your emails. Um, but given that it is one o'clock and we um, um, are going to end now and uh, wish everyone a great uh, weekend and uh, we'll see you all back here next Thursday for another talk on dermatology. Any, uh, and I hope everyone um, has a nice day. See ya. Bye. Thanks you guys. Bye. Bye.